Welcome you all here. We're going to invite our veterans in and then we'll start our ceremony. Thank you for coming out today. Thank you for joining us today to celebrate Veterans Day. Veterans Day is an official U.S. holiday that honors people who have served our armed services. Those women and men are, are known as veterans. Veterans Day is celebrated on November 11th, but since we don't have school that day, we're celebrating today. today. Sometimes people mix up Memorial Day and Veterans Day. Memorial Day is in May and is for remembering and honoring people who have died while serving our country. Veterans Day is a time to say thank you to those who have fought for our country. We interviewed, the, we, entered, we interviewed all of the veterans who are here today and all together they served for more, to a, more than a hundred years.
Good job, Ben Franklin. We'd like to give our veterans a chance to introduce themselves. So if you're very careful listeners, you'll get to learn a little bit about all of the pretty cool people we have with us today. Veterans, if you don't mind telling us your age, if you'd like to share the branch, thank you, sir. I'm Bob McHugh, and I served in the Army Air Corps in World War II in Korea and the Korean War in the Air Force. Yes, my name is Paul Clark, and I served in the uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom in the uh, Air Force, 20-year veteran. Good morning, I'm Dr. Chet Kulak. I served in the United States Navy as a dental officer. My duty station was NAS Lickhurst, and I served for a total of reserve time, eight years. My name is Joel Vendor. I served in the U.S. Air Force, and I served in at part of the Air Force Advisory Team 7 in Vietnam. Good morning, Ben Franklin. My name is Brian Biddings. I served in the U.S. Army, um, Air Assault, Army Strong. Hello, I'm Tyreek Brown. I served in the Marines for six years. Hello, I'm Jewish White. I served in the United States Air Force on the Vietnam vet, and I served seven years. Tim McMahon uh, served in the Marine Corps, Vietnam. Travis is my grandson. <laughs> my name is Robert Berger. I did four years in the Marines wherever they sent me. <laughs> I'm Michael Colucchio. I served two years in the Army in Vietnam. And the other Travis is my grandson. <laughs> My name is Frank Haggerty, and I served four years in the Air Force and here in Vietnam. My name is uh, Dave Offerdahl. I was a uh, Navy pilot uh, for 32 years, two months, and 19 days, and um, did just about everything in that period of time. Hi, I'm uh, Sang Nguyen. I served in the U.S. Navy for six years on USS Nimitz and was in uh, Enduring Freedom. I'm Matt Pilardo. Uh, I served in the U.S. Navy for five years on U.S. Abraham Lincoln. Hi, I'm Ron Walker. I served in the 101st Airborne and the 82nd Airborne for seven and a half years. I'm Mike Giglio. Oliver is my grandson. I served six years total in the United States Navy. My name is Ray Freiling. I served in the United States Army and the 1st Infantry Division in Vietnam. Uh, my name is Everett Keller. I served uh, three years in the 82nd Airborne Division and uh, one year in uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. Thank you. Someone you know up here, can you raise your hand if you see a dad or a grandpa or a neighbor or someone? That's pretty cool that these people served our country and they're connected to our school too. First graders, can you carefully stand up to sing our song?
guess what, Ben Franklin? We have a very special person who's going to talk to you today. Are you ready to do your very best listening? Yeah. All right, then I'm going to invite Mr. McHugh to come up and speak to us. Good morning. This is a little uh, tale of my journey westward towards World War II when I was a uh, young boy of 19 years old. And uh, I wrote this for a memoir class at the Lawrence Senior Center, so I'm reading it from my tablet. Departing from Salinas Air Army Air Base in our Curtis twin C-46 aircraft, the setting sun barely helps illuminate the dimly lit San Francisco, California Golden Gate Bridge. Federally mandated due to enemy Japanese submarines operating offshore, that bridge's steel cables were manufactured by the Roebling Company in my hometown, Trenton, New Jersey. The date was January 27, 1945. Our destination, Hickam Field, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. It was the first leg of about 2,400 miles of our Trans-Pacific mission, and the last view our crew would see of the USA for a very long time. I had enlisted on July the 2nd, 1943, when I was 17 years old, after graduating from Trenton High School, and now I was a 19-year-old, newly commissioned second lieutenant officer, an eager, proud, and confident navigator in the United States Army Air Corps. This would be my first official assignment, and I felt up to the task. Our strictly assigned altitude was 9,000 feet. Because radio silence was mandatory, no request for altitude change was permitted. At 10,000 feet altitude, oxygen masks would be required, and we carried no oxygen, but instead a cargo of huge aircraft fuel-filled tanks. Their contents for delivery to ready Allied air bases overseas. As you may know, oxygen, gasoline, and electricity are not, to put it mildly, on very friendly terms. All the crew were well aware of this potential hazard. Weather forecast promised favorable winds and clear overhead skies. I was well prepared for a long night of celestial navigation, using the stars of constellations I had become very familiar with in my training. This promised to be a very rewarding travel experience, challenging, yes, most satisfying. Unfortunately, a few obstacles suddenly arose to defer that great uh, expectation. No problema, I was sure my crew could handle them. Allow me to introduce my crew. Pilot, Captain Joe Figueroa Fig, age 24. Co-pilot, First Lieutenant Gino Conacenti, Connie, age 23. Navigator, Second Lieutenant Robert McHugh, Mac, age 19. Radio operator, Sergeant James Brown, Jim, age 21. Crew chief, Sergeant Charles Conroy, Pop. He was the oldest, age 27. As we approached flight altitude, I laid out my flight chart on the small navigator's table, just behind the co-pilot seat. The plane's water tank above me began to leak. I grabbed away my flight chart, and just in time to avoid a cascade of water that had burst from the tank's cap, my crew chief, Pop, had filled the tank to the brim failing to allow for the reduction of atmospheric pressure with our increase in altitude. A high school physics lesson learned the hard way. Fortunately, no damage was incurred as Pop and I swiped up the water from the little table. I again laid out my rescue flight chart and readied my equipment, thermometer essential to determine longitude, my trusted Hamilton timepiece that I had prorated to a two-second loss in the week's testing, logbook, protractor, dividers, pencil erasures, and the required celestial navigation guidebooks. Calculating our westward course, allowing for variation, deviation, and force can wind direction and velocity, I gave the man an heading to FIG, and we were off to Hawaii. We leveled off at 9,000 feet as the sun settled below the horizon. I soon discovered that the weather forecast had erred. Not clear overhead skies, but rather a complete overcast. No bright, starry constellations to be seen. 
darkness above and darkness below. I've tried to conceal the anxious feeling of my own internal darkness. My drift meter was useless. I couldn't measure wind drift from the ocean surface, point caps because it was night and I couldn't see the ocean. I couldn't see the stars above because there was no break in the overcast. I just have to wait hours until sunrise. By then, hopefully, conditions might improve. But doubt continued to dominate my troubled thoughts. What if the forecast of favorable winds was also in error? I began to have that uneasy, queasy feeling that precedes panic. After a sleepless night, at last the welcome sun peeked over the horizon. Using my drift meter, I looked below to scan the ocean's surface for the breaking waves white caps used to measure the wind direction. I was stunned. Unbelievable. No white caps. The ocean surface was becalmed, a sheet of glass. I was experiencing an air navigator's nightmare, an overcast at night, a becalmed ocean at daybreak. I could feel my heartbeat quicken. Again, panic was knocking at my brain. At least the sky above was clear, and the rising sun ahead was shining brightly. A slight glimmer of hope eased my anxiety. My annoying panic was interrupted by a sudden call from Fig on the intercom. Hey, Mac, how we doing? My reply was quick, right on track. I didn't add, I think. The realization that we were somewhere over the vast Pacific Ocean and my crew depended on me to get them to Hawaii was a little scary. I had no idea exactly where we were. What do I do now? I had to do something. First, I had to calm down, think, and may have sought some divine intervention. Sighting that sunrise triggered a potential solution to the problem. I remembered in my air navigation training a remote, never practiced triangulation technique called the noonday fix. It is based on tracking the 30 minute angular transit of the sun as it processes directly overhead determine at that time the exact location above the Earth's surface. I had enough time and the proper equipment to give it a try. In truth, it was my only option. An answer to my prayer? Again, the intertom call from Fig. Hey, Mac, what's our ETA? Estimated time of arrival. My immediate response, working on it, will advise shortly. To answer that question, I had to find out exactly where the heck we were then, and I didn't have a clue. As noon approached, I mounted my octant, a more accurate instrument updated from the eight mirrors from the former six mirror sextant in the plane's overhead glass dome, selected the appropriate celestial manual, and proceeded to measure the relative angles of the Earth and Sun's travel at 1145, 12, and 1215 GMT, Greenwich Mean Time marking the data in my navigation log. Next step, with the help of my manual, calculating the three angular measurements of the Earth and Sun and transferring that data to my chart. Imagine my amazement as I plotted the triangulation results, pinpointing our exact location above the Earth's Pacific Ocean. My actual first use of the noonday fix appeared to prove a spectacular success to my great relief, I found we were just a few miles south of our planned course and about halfway to Hawaii. At least the forecast wind info had been pretty accurate. With that data, I proceeded to calculate our ground speed, distance to Pearl, adjusted heading, and projected ETA. Renewed with confidence, I called Fig, gave him the compass correction, our estimated time of arrival, now all I had to do was wait and see if my data were correct. So I decided to relax and enjoy the beautiful blue ocean. Did you know that at altitude the Pacific Ocean appears blue? Well, I found out a few years later flying above the Atlantic Ocean that it appears green. Sometime later, when the Hawaiian Islands appeared ahead, Fig announced to the entire crew over the intercom, great job, Mac. My nervous tension finally relieved I had become a true basket case. It was really kind of gratifying to hear the other guys cheering. We landed at Hickam Field, Pearl Harbor. The first leg of our Trans-Pacific Mission was complete. 
we did it. A little footnote, three days later, this trusted timepiece stopped running when they accidentally dropped it on the coral landing strip on Tarawa and operations replaced with a new one, but not yet rated one, another obstacle. Thank you very much. Like somehow I saved that navigation chart which Jay is holding up for me here. And you can see the dark edges, that's where I had to fold the map down to fit the table with a very small space. But there's the triangulation fix where I found myself and it's a great map. Thanks very much. Second graders, can you please stand up? to share a poem with you called On Veterans Day. Listen carefully. On Veterans Day, we honor all who answered to a service call, soldiers young and soldiers old, fought for freedom, brave and bold. Some have lived while others died. All of them deserve our proud. We are proud of all the soldiers who Kept thinking of red, white, and blue. They fought for us in all our rights. They fought through days, they fought through nights. Although we may not know each name, we thank all veterans just the same. Ben Franklin, guess what song? we're about to sing. We would like to invite the parents, the teachers, all of the Ben Franklin students, our veterans, our honored guests, everyone to join us in singing the grand old flag. So friends, stay sitting right where you are and we're gonna sing together.
Boys and girls, that ends our ceremony today. I want to again thank our honored guests, the veterans. Please give them a round of applause. Thank you. We will have a few short minutes for the third graders to ask some questions, so stay seated. Um, at this time, pre-K and K, go ahead and get up to go.